thank you, thank you, the thank you, Pauline, and thank you the, for the to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, yeah, it's a pity that we cannot meet uh, in person, and I hope that uh, we'll be able to do soon uh, because there are many topics uh, which seem to be similar between us, and it's interesting. Okay, so today um, I will talk about uh, some of our work in a project where we uh, are trying to what we call extend the human body. So my basic interest is in uh, human-robot interaction. And um, if you look at human-robot interaction, it's uh, uh, this is my personal view of it. Uh, it has changed a lot in the last 40 years. So about 40 years ago in the 1980s, we had the first robots which were uh, uh, commercialized. They were in industries. And these first gen generation robots were always behind cages. And, uh, and we always tried to see uh, there were cages, there were uh, barriers to make sure that the human do not come in even near them, even by mistake. So basically the first generation uh, robot human interactions were basically no interactions. And during this time, uh, the research in robot uh, human interactions was trying to see how to remove these cages, how to bring the robots close by. And this happened in the early 2010s maybe when robots started to slowly come near us. We started having robots in our uh, house but still the interactions were very basic and there was hardly any physical interaction. But as you know, with current robotic research, uh, what I feel is in the third generation, we are trying to increase as much as possible the physical human robot interactions. And uh, there are many questions remaining in this still. But from the last five years or so, I feel that the robotics community is slowly moving towards what I call the fourth generation robot human interactions. Where the robots are not just close to the humans, but they start to become part of the human body. And uh, this fourth generation human robot interactions is very different, fundamentally different from the previous generations because of one key reason is that in all the previous generations, you, there was a clear distinction between the robot and the human, which was the boundary of the human body. But now this boundary is, uh, becomes ambiguous. And this leads to several challenges in robotics and uh, neuroscience. Uh, uh, for these kind of fourth generation interactions. So in robotics, you have, uh, of course, the problems of prediction of human user intention and movements, which are there for all the generations, but they become more important now because of the proximity of the fourth generation robots. And, uh, and now you have to also adapt the control and the techniques that we have in robotics for these new interaction concepts. So on the neuroscience side, you have the big issue of embodiment, trying to understand how these machines are being incorporated in our body by the humans, how it changes our brain, how it changes our behavior. And if you know all this, you can start to understand what are the limitations of this. How many, for example, how many machines can be embodied and, uh, and how many should be embodied, above which it's actually bad for you. And if you know these limitations, you can come back to robotics and you can start thinking about uh, uh, what is a good user interface, how to make the user interface efficient in these kind of interactions, and also develop intelligence. So in these kind of interactions, you want the user to control the robot, but at the same time, you don't want him to be controlling every aspect of the robot. That will be too demanding cognitively. You want some parts to be automatic in the robot, like we have now with our limbs. Uh, there are a lot of automatic systems with our um, spinal cord and brain, which we do not control cognitively. So we want some intelligence and some integration of intelligence and uh, and user control. And all this, uh, the inter intelligence and the interface would determine how you perceive these systems as a, as a person. And on the other hand, the robots have to be developed or uh, the control has to be changed depending on understanding the perception of humans. And all these factors to, in total will determine uh, the accept, acceptance of these devices uh, in, in, by the users and also by society. And then understanding all this, we can go towards uh, one big question, which is of ethical issues. So when you come to these kind of augmentations of functional and sensory augmentations, what are the ethical concerns? So in our project uh, with our collaborators, uh, we are in, interested in this uh, comprehensive understanding of what we call fourth generation uh, robot human interactions. And uh, we strongly believe, or at least I strongly believe that at least the four generation robots, uh, uh, the robots can improve a lot if you have a good understanding of the neuroscience uh, that uh, governs human behaviors. So for example, so if you think of a 
simple problem like uh, how would you design a fourth generation interaction? Let's say an extra limb. Um, so uh, traditionally, you would, uh, as a robotician, you would think of uh, a limb with good controllability, good safety. That's true. A limb that's easy for you to use, so good user interface maybe, and of course aesthetics. But now you can also think about, because it's a fourth generation uh, interaction, you can also think about, uh, should you also design it so that it's easy to embody? Or on the other hand, uh, 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 there's the question of, you know, what, what limb would be embodied by the human and what would not? Because it's important to know this because we know that embodiment starts to change your behavior and also change your performance in tasks. So if you have this question, now we can answer this only if you go to neuroscience. So what can the human body, uh, human body embody, human brain embody rather? So uh, this question has been asked a lot in uh, neuroscience for a long time. And uh, the question of embodiment in neuroscience became popular after this famous study of uh, by Botanik and Cohen in uh, 1998, uh, where they showed the rubber hand illusion. And uh, I guess uh, in this workshop, most of the people know what this illusion is, but uh, maybe just to summarize, uh, well, in this illusion, uh, what they showed was if you cover the left hand, uh, can you see my cursor here? Yeah. You can, right? Okay. So if you cover the left hand of a human user and, uh, uh, and you provide him with an artificial limb, so in this case, a hand made of rubber, so that's why the rubber hand. And if you provide some stimulation simultaneously to his real hand and the rubber hand, then this, this situation where you have, visually you, you see the rubber hand and not your real hand, but you feel something from your real hand as it makes you feel as if this feeling of touch comes from the real hand. And it's a very strong feeling. In fact, uh, I don't know if you've not tried it, you should try it to understand what exactly this means. But uh, basically what it's interpreted as is that slowly our brain starts to embody or rather I, I, I would use the term uh, own here because most of uh, robotics, uh, sorry, neuroscience literature has concentrated on the ownership aspect of embodiment. So your brain starts to own this body. You, feel, you start to believe that this hand, this rubber hand is your hand. So basically what they showed was um, in the brain, the, the ownership is kind of an illusion, which is determined by uh, a, a bottom-up process, which is a congru which is congruent multisensory uh, feedback. So sorry, this blob is the brain for me. Uh, but this is not the whole story. So does this mean that you can embody or you can own any object if I, if I go through this procedure? No. So it was shown that, you know, if you instead take a stick instead of the hand, you will not be able to embody it. So it's not just this. So it seems that there is also a second process, which is a top-down process where actually a body seems or a brain seems to have a, what, what's called a body model, a representation of a body in the brain. And if somehow this rubber hand or whatever you're trying to embody does not correspond, correspond to that, you cannot embody it. Now the question is, uh, what is this body model? What does it uh, incorporate? How, how is our body defined? So the most basic thing you can think of is that maybe uh, because you see your hand all the time, you know how your hand looks. So maybe the color, the shape and the size and stuff is what the body is uh, expecting when it tries to embody another object. But this is not true. So people have shown that when you do the rubber hand experiment with a white rubber hand, a plastic one, you can embody it, even though it looks nothing like your hand. You can embody also a hand which is of a different gender. And uh, you can embody uh, a limb or even a total body even of, of a different race. So again, related to the color. Uh, you can also embody something that is much bigger than your hand. So if you take a rubber hand, which is much larger than your real hand, you can embody it and you can embody something that is longer. But if it's smaller, you have difficulty emb embodying it. But when it comes to whole body embodiment, even if it's small, it's very well known that you can embody the body very well. It's not a problem. And um, uh, you, people have shown that you can actually embody two hands uh, to replace your one real hand. And you can also, but you cannot embody if uh, the rubber hand or whatever hand you're trying to embody is of a wrong handedness. So if you try to embody your left hand onto with using a right rubber hand, you cannot do that. So it's, it's very confusing. There are very contradictory results. So people said, okay, so is the, is the fact that, you know, they are not very human, is the humanness important? So it's true that, you know, you cannot embody a wooden stick instead of your rubber hand, instead of your hand, a wooden slab, a rubber sheet, and when it comes to the whole body, 
I cannot embody a cuboid. But when it comes to robots, even though they are not very human, you can embody it. So it basically means how this works is that in all these experiments, people try to do or we try to do uh, rubber hand illusion experiments, uh, but with uh, instead of the rubber hand using robot hands. And you can very well embody it, even the whole body, even though you clearly see that it's not human-like, even though in some sense it's human. This is what we want, want, want to know what it is. You, you can embody it. There are spatial constraints. So if you put a rubber hand very far away from you, outside of what's so-called the peripersonal space, you cannot embody it. And if it's in the wrong orientation, you cannot embody it. But when it comes to whole bodies, you can place it as, as far as you want. Uh, you can embody it. And you can also have another orientations. So basically, when you think of uh, what, what can we embody, or what does the brain, uh, uh, what can the brain be fooled into thinking it's our body? It's, there are lots of controversial uh, uh, data. So you can embody some stuff, but you cannot embody something else. So obviously, it seems that physical, a physical body model is not the reason behind. So about a few years ago, we thought about, can it be all explained maybe by a functional body model? So what does it mean? So if we think that in, instead of looking at uh, the physical features as a whole, you think of the functional reasons behind why you have limbs. Um, you can assume that you know the body model, uh, the top-down regulation of the ownership is done uh, of an entity is determined by whether the entity can afford actions that the brain expects from the limb. So what does it mean? So this hypothesis that we thought uh, assumes or uh, hypothesizes, in fact, that you know with our brain and we have used our body for a long time, so we have learned to associate each limb with some actions that it can perform. So for example, a hand would be for reaching and let's say uh, grabbing or grasping. And then when you see a new entity, a rubber hand, for example, our brain attributes a perceived entity as our limb only if its physical features are sufficient to afford the actions the brain has associated with the limb. So if you consider this, it's very funny, but you can, you can explain many of these results. So for example, let's say that we go back to the, um, the rubber hand I presented earlier. So if you see a hand, so the functionality that you would associate your hand with uh, is reaching and grasping, for example. So grasping, for example, requires fingers. Grasping maybe requires, uh, reaching requires joints. Color is not important for reaching and grasping. So that would explain why embodiment is not sensitive to color. So you can embody colors, uh, hands of different color. Similarly, gender. Gender would not limit your uh, affordance of many uh, uh, actions that you associate your hand with. So you can embody it. And similarly for race. When it comes to body, the functionality you can think of is uh, you'll be, you should, that the most basic functionality is most mobility. So you can walk around wherever you want. So as long as you can see a body that can walk around, you don't care about the color. And that explains why you can embody a, full, uh, a, a body of a different color. And similarly, big and long, uh, they, uh, they arguably don't impede your reach and grasp so much compared to a small hand. So if you have a small hand, you, uh, it impedes your uh, affordances a lot. So maybe this is the reason why you don't embody a small hand. But when it comes to a small body, you can embody it because it has been shown that uh, when you embody into a small body, this again is a very nice illusion and very strong. You actually feel that your body is not small. So even if you're embodying into a small body, you feel that your body has not become small, but the world has become larger. So it's a very well documented effect. So because of this, you can exp you can understand that uh, okay, uh, you know the affordances are not lost. So maybe this is why you can uh, embody small bodies. Um, something that's outside the PPS uh, cannot be embodied is uh, very obvious because affordances of uh, hand are defined for us only within the PPS. But on the other hand, when it comes to a body, because mobility is the main reason. Uh, you you don't care about the PPS because the mobility by uh, definition is uh, going far away and the, your PPS or per present space is in fact body centric. It's supposed to move with your body. So it explains why you can embody a, a body when it's far away, but not a hand. And similarly, you can ex also explain something of about orientation. So if you go to again, uh, these objects which you cannot embody, uh, basically, uh, our hypothesis is that you know you cannot embody because not because they don't look human, 
but because of the fact that you know they don't have the features especially for example uh, fingers and joints for a hand which would afford you the uh, the actions that you associate with it and that's why you cannot embody on the other hand even if it's a robot hand if you can perceive fingers and if you can control them controllability is very important you can embody them because uh, you feel that you it, it is sufficient or at least uh, partly sufficient for the functionalities that you want to use the limb for so this functional uh, body model is uh, it's still a hypothesis but it's very nice that it can explain a lot of things uh, cleanly uh, not all I, i must say but uh, it does explain a lot of things and it has important information for robotics so if i come back to the question of how you should design uh, a fourth generation interaction well uh, an uh, a fourth generation robot for that for the matter then uh, uh, it shows that uh, what is important is it doesn't have to be as much human like in terms of uh, corporality but rather in terms of the features as in functional features which which are more important but the story is a bit more complicated because uh, it's not over there so basically uh, when you come when you look at uh, functional augmentations with robots in uh, fourth generation interactions you normally want additional limbs you want to add limbs which is at least many of the studies want to add additional limbs but on the other hand all the embodiment studies and ownership studies have been have been more for limb replacement rather than limb augmentation so rubber hand illusion by definition is um, illusion where you try to replace one hand with another not you don't try to add another one so the question remains uh, can you really add uh, what happens if you have an additional limb a truly additional limb is one where it's kinematically independent uh, of control so that means you can move this limb independent of any other limb and plus it also gives uh, independent feedback so you have feedback from this limb that is independent of any other limb so if you have a limb like this can you embody it so to check that uh, we did one experiment uh, where we developed a very simple in fact uh, additional finger with two key features we uh, the one key one feature is that it it has kinematic independence we try to use uh, the null space from the emg activity to uh, to have something very intuitive and easy to use but still which enables you to move every part of your body not just your other fingers independent of this finger and plus we also give uh, additional uh, independent haptic feedback so this uh, this robot comes with a small pin which moves when the finger moves so basically it's trying to give you feedback in another from another modality of the movement and we try to see if uh, you know if you train the participants with this not uh, as in you know let them experience it for a long time can they can they embody it can they own it and we try to take not just questionnaires but also behavioral measures of what is called body image and body skin but what we found was in fact even after about a half an hour of training which is uh, half an hour of use which is quite large compared to rubber hand illusion experiments which, which where the illusion occurs in a few minutes you do not have uh, so much of ownership in this uh, uh, in, with this uh, Uh, additional limbs um you we don't see any change in body schema but interestingly we do see, see some changes in the body image so the participants have problems uh, localizing uh, their little finger so uh, in conclusion uh, the, the data is still inconclusive because we have done only for 30 minutes for example but it seems that uh, when it comes to independent limbs uh, embodying or ownership is not as easy as it would be for replacing but at the same time uh, the body image changes which is a good sign because uh, it shows that uh, the embodiment is tending towards uh, uh, limb embodiment rather than it being tools and in every case it's very important that you have good controllability and the agency is extremely important and this brings us back to robotics so with robotics the big challenge with these uh, systems is that to have the right balance so you don't want like i said the human controlling every aspect of the robot the movement because it will be cognitively tiring at the same time i don't think we can expect a, a robot which can be so intelligent to as to understand what the human wants and do it automatically so we need to think about practically some kind of a balance where the two are together working together so we i don't have time today but uh, very shortly so we are also working on a lot of uh, experiments on this looking at bmi systems improving bmi systems and adding intelligence to um, robotics 
uh, in terms of uh, human cognition and also in terms of uh, understanding human feelings, uh, trying to see how uh, these can be integrated into this fourth generation robotics. And in fact, we find that uh, st studies of neuroscience and in fact embodiment itself can be a kind of a tool to improve the behavior of these robots. So we are working on a few uh, procedures on that. Um, so, so I conclude uh, quickly. So I, I, today I concentrated a bit more on the neuroscience side, but, uh, but uh, in this fourth generation robots, I think it's a very interesting topic. There are many inter open inter neuroscience questions. There are many open robotics questions. Robotics questions is basically the question of safety, human interactive control, planning, but they, have, they are amplified because of the uh, proximity of the robot. And there are these issues are, I think, will become very important for robotics and also the ethical issues uh, related to that would be very important. So many, many uh, interesting research questions. So we have, uh, we, we keep our job for some more years, definitely. So um, yes, to conclude, uh, yeah, so what I presented here was uh, a lot of the work is from a, a joint work with our collaborators in Japan in a Japanese project where CNRS is a partner. And uh, yes, yeah, so, and like I said, there are many interesting questions. We are doing a lot of things. And uh, if you're interested, uh, please contact uh, us. And we are very happy to uh, discuss and answer also your questions. Thank you. Sorry, uh, so now I'm supposed to press the question answer button. Is that so? Oh. Um, right. No, thank uh, no. I will. I will handle the question. Actually, it was not clear, but I will handle the question and I will just ask you the questions that are in the chat so that you can... Ah, I see. Check. Okay. I mean, you can okay. also check them by yourself, but... Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, chat, chat, chat. Oops. I so, don't see the chat when I share. Okay. Um, um, so basically, we have one, one question uh, that is, um, do you know if the humans who embodied robot ants were robotic researchers or more general public who may be less familiar with the devices? So uh, in these experiments, we purposely take, we try to take people who are not familiar with robots, because uh, the problem is, uh, uh, if, if uh, I think we, you all do human robot in, uh, human robo inter interaction experiments, you would know that uh, if you take robotics, of course there's a robotics bias which makes a big difference, but plus I think uh, robotics researchers or researchers in general we think too much. And if you think too much, uh, there are there's a lot of bias in this feeling, especially in these rubber hand illusion experiments. So in fact, in all these experiments, we, we have purposely tried to take people who don't have so much experience with uh, robots. Thank you. Um, so everyone can, I mean, I don't know if- uh, Can I, I ask? Can, yeah, can sure. I ask also questions? Yes, please. Ah. Very good talk. I'm very inspired and I have plenty of questions. I will try to be oh, short. Sure. Uh, first, I, uh, uh, this is not a question, but a comment on what you just said. I tried the rubber end illusion and I agree with you that we think too much. I, I was trying <laughs> to identify. At the end, I, I figured out that I was controlling uh, with the last two fingers, I was controlling the sixth. I see. So, uh, ah, you did. Uh, so you did. Uh, uh, you did some experiment where you control. Yes. Uh, yes. I did an experiment where uh, where they were touching my hand, and okay. in the virtual reality there were six fingers. I see. And then I, I see. and the sixth finger for uh, so I did some tests of a very. I mean, so the yeah. guy was a bit disappointed, but I was <laughs> testing myself, um, and I yes. was controlling with the, with these two the, with the last two fingers. It was very interesting because there was a sort of inverse kinematics. There was a around uh, very interesting so yeah but i think the other were enjoying so i was like figuring out so yeah. it was so <laughs> so this illusion uh, it, it is illusion it works for about 70 percent of the people in general and uh -huh. maybe much lesser if you are a researcher the percentage is much lesser i guess because we think too much because we start thinking ah oh, why this is happening should this happen or not and stuff like this and it's not normally uh, yeah. i mean it's it's not how the common common perception works in, in the public so usually uh, we try to avoid uh, especially with this uh, uh, these kind of experiments embodiment experiments the uh, well the bias can really change your result very fast so uh, so yes so because of that yeah so you have so, another question other than that yeah? yes because i have uh, so i have two questions because in your slide, so you, how do you measure ownership so it's a good question so there are some measures, uh, behavioral measures, which are controversial. So one is, of course, the proprioceptive drift, uh, which is the most commonly used. Uh, 
where you basically try to see uh, well the idea basically is that uh, uh, i mean uh, because you are also from robotics i can tell you that you have a you have a, your inverse kinematics in your in your body so your right hand kind of knows where your left hand is and uh, proprioceptive drift basically tries to see if this mapping of where your right hand is in your internal uh, uh, inter inverse kinematic space is modified so we ask people so do, to uh, do, you, to do this you ask them to to ah, okay to touch without, exactly okay. touch touch without looking uh, and uh, there is a result to show that uh, you if if you well um the, it it tends to change you tend to start uh, pressing more and more towards the rubber hand but it's controversial because there is also data to show that it's maybe independent of ownership but it's it's one measure that you can use uh, and uh, there are other measures not directly for ownership but uh, you can use measures of what are called body schema and body image body schema is basically related to your internal representation mm -hmm. and body image very simply is kind of your uh, you know the visual space re representation so it's actually the mapping between the visual vision space and our uh, joint space which is the yeah. body image which represents body image so you can test those things it's been used a lot especially in tool embodiment embodiment of tools not limbs um uh, but uh, yes ownership is uh, yeah normally questionnaires and with these kind of uh, measures yeah you can also use uh, um gsr you know I i'm sure you must have seen you know people getting yeah. knife near you and they try to check if you have a response in your skin conductivity yeah which works but it's very noisy so it uh, so it depends on person and also day and, and like day. in your experience can we use something related to eeg data to measure so there is Yes so there is one study uh, showing that you can measure ownership uh, uh, with eeg which is uh, at a particular uh, uh, time time period a uh, particular frequency profile I, i guess yeah there is one study so if you're interested i can i can send you that but it's uh, it's uh, it's not very uh, uh, robust uh, not robust I, i shouldn't say robust but it's it's not for single trial recordings so if you want to if you do it many many times because eeg data in in general is very noisy you need to uh, average many trials so if you can if you are, if your experiment can do that maybe this is one measure okay thank you very much thank we you will very discuss much cast of line then yeah maybe we can take a, I, we will take one more questions from the audience and of course i mean then we can at the end of the workshop or during the break we can continue the discussion and also um so if you just for all the all the speakers if you check the q q and a button at the bottom of the screen you will see all questions and maybe you can give an answer a text answer to questions that would have been answered um so just one additional question from the audience um which is um what are your thoughts on how the level of automation in a supernumerary limb might affect the potential embodiment of that limb So um again it's i think it's a very good question so um automation of course is you know uh, the nice thing is that uh, uh, so if you consider the previous generation robotics the more automation is better in the sense that you know if the robot can do uh, know what you want to do and do very nicely uh, it's uh, and it's good for the task you normally consider it to be good but uh, like the question suggests in the fourth generation it's a bit different so uh with automation it's very important what is very important is the feeling of agency so if the if the robot becomes uh, so autonomous that you don't feel that you are controlling it you lose embodiment so the automation should only be to the level that uh, you know you still feel that you are the one who is controlling and this agency aspect is extremely important for uh, not just for embodiment but we find also for the fact uh, also for people to like the device and you know uh, accept the device in general so if you feel that the robot is not responding to uh, how um, uh, what you want it to do and not responding according to what you expect it to do it it affects a lot how you if you embody it or also if you accept it if you like it yeah. well thank you very much uh, 